Hey guys, hello, hello. Hope you're all doing well. It's been a minute since I talked about the Delphi case. It's maybe a couple of weeks. <laughs> um, but there's not really been any any new updates. I mean, there's been filings, but nothing earth shattering until this came out. This is the transcript from the motion to dismiss the case, which Judge Gull her outcome was that she was going to take it under advisement. So, yeah. So there's no way that this case is going to get dismissed. Absolutely no way whatsoever. But they gave it the they gave it a shot. So there's a bunch of creators who've got together and bought the transcript for the motion to dismiss hearing. So this is 81 pages of word for word as tra as transcribed as as collected by the court reporter and um the creators include um the defense diaries the unraveling sleuthy goosey i think and I'm, i don't know whether there was anyone else who grouped together and bought this transcript so I got this off Reddit, and I think it's Lucy Goosey's watermark. Because they bought it, they've watermarked them. I think that's Lucy Goosey's watermark, but I got this from Reddit. And I'm not going to read it word for word. There are channels who are reading it word for word. The Defence Diaries read it all last night between uh, Bob and Ali. They, they managed to get it all. <laughs> and... Um, criminality is doing it which was pretty entertaining because you had a bunch of people acting as all the different people <laughs> so it was it was entertaining but she's doing it bit by bit so she did like the first part uh, last night and then she's going to do it section by section so in this motion to dismiss hearing much of it was uh, Todd Click who was giving evidence, Todd Click being one of the law enforcement officers who investigated the Odinists. So there was Todd Click, Murphy, and uh, Ferency. And they started investigating the Odinist angle to the Delphi case in 2018, when they realised they were actually doing a, a different investigation, but they realised that there was potentially something going down here in relation to what certain people knew about the Delphi murders, knew things that they shouldn't have known. So they started to investigate the likes of Elvis Fields. I think he was the first guy that they, they looked at. There was Brad Holder, Patrick Westfall, Johnny Messer, uh, Rod Abrams, um, there was another guy. There's a, there's a couple of other guys also that have been mentioned in this in this uh, hearing, but they they didn't appear in the Frank's memorandum from September of last year. But I'm not going to focus on Todd Click's testimony because we've talked a lot on this channel about the Odinists and over on Michelle After Dark, obviously, as well. And Todd Click's testimony is interesting. It's it's really interesting to, you know, to read it in his own words. It would have been even more good if we could have actually listened to him in his own words, but Judge Francis Gull obviously doesn't want cameras in the courtroom. But this is the very next best thing. So it's interesting reading this in Todd Click's own words, being one of the investigators who only stopped investigating the Odinist angle in 2021 after Greg Ferency was murdered. Murdered, I tell you. Well, that put a stop to their investigation. However, when Richard Allen was arrested, Todd Click sought the advice of an attorney and together they drafted a letter to Nick McClelland, to the prosecutor, saying that their investigation, which was a three-year investigation of the Odinists, was way more compelling. They got way more evidence 
than Nick McClelland appeared to have against Richard Allen. So the letter went unreplied to, but ultimately he did get a meeting with McClelland and uh, thought that he was going to get invited in and they were going to tell him, like in confidence, all the evidence that they had against Richard Allen that wasn't in the probable cause affidavit. But no, 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 they didn't. They didn't because it appears that maybe that's the only evidence they've got against Richard Allen. And when he was leaving the office, who was sitting in the lobby there? But Brad Holder, interesting. Anyhow, that's not what we're talking about. I want to concentrate on um, these lost interviews. If you remember, it's come to light that, um, you know, during the course of Brad Rosie and Andrew Baldwin's investigation into the discovery, which they've got a lot, voluminous discovery, in the words of uh, Brad and Andy, voluminous, they like that word, voluminous discovery. But there's a whole bunch of stuff missing. And it appears that um, they unearthed a summary, a summary report, a short summary report of a police interview with Brad Holder on the 17th of February 2017. So just uh, four days after the murders and three days after Abby and Libby were found. Brad Holder was brought in. Why? Because people were ringing in about him being a potential suspect. But they already had him in their sights anyway because his son was going out with Abby Williams. Her boyfriend, Logan Holder, was the boyfriend of Abby Williams. So, it you know, the, the Holders needed to be investigated. But they had no corresponding interview. Like, they had this summary but no corresponding interview. And it turned out, you remember this, you remember this, you've been following the case. It turned out that oh, a whole bunch of things have been lost off, uh, off the tape and they couldn't get them back. Couldn't get them back. So I'm going to read you just parts of this transcript and I'm, I'm going to paraphrase most of it, to be honest. Just the sections relating to the loss of these police interviews because it's hilarious <laughs> it's hilarious how Stephen Mullen here on the stand who was the uh, chief of the Delphi police at the time Stephen Mullen is now the one of the investigators who works in the prosecutor's office so he works with Slicky Nicky now but at the time he was the chief of police. So they're interviewing Stephen Mullen. Okay. Yeah, Brad Holder is about 5'10", uh, allegedly. Patrick Westfall's the big guy. He's like six foot five or something. I don't know how tall Elvis Fields is and Johnny Messer. Johnny Messer looks about the same height as Brad Holder. Like when you see them in pictures, but I don't know about Elvis Fields. He he looks smaller, to be honest, but I, I don't. I wouldn't know how big he is. And and the just the, the ridiculous stuff, you know, about them not thoroughly checking their alibis. <laughs> like we heard from the memorandum that Elvis Fields and Rod Abrams were almost like alibis for each other. But it turns out that they weren't actually where they said they were on the day that the girls were murdered. And Brad Holder was supposedly at work the day the girls were murdered, but his shift finished mid-afternoon. So, no, he wouldn't have been able to go from where he worked to the bridge to actually kidnap the girls but well, he could have come along later, couldn't he? Because we don't actually know the time the girls were murdered because the um, autopsy report has never come out. So we've never heard from the medical examiner whether they've been able to say that the girls were murdered maybe around 3 p.m. on the 13th 
or whether they were murdered sometime during the night or even the following morning. We don't know. Now, the, the medical examiner should be able to give an estimation for an approximate time of death based on the degree of rigor mortis and also the degree of lividity or rather the where they lived like let's say for example they were killed and then some time later moved the blood pooling that happens after death um can give things away in that regard so there may be an estimate out there as to when the girls actually died but we haven't seen it so so there's that patrick westfall his alibi was his son. His son was his alibi. However, his son was at school that day. He happened to give that away during his um, interview with Sleuth Intuition. Not a lot of people picked up on that, but anyway, I did. All right, so we're going to read about how these files were lost. Okay, so we're starting on page 47. If anybody wants to um, read along you can go to uh, Delphi Docs on Reddit and just download it um, I think Sleuthy Goose is putting on a Twitter I think as well it may be in other places I haven't checked all right so the where are we going to start right, we're going to start part way down okay we'll start here We'll start here. So the question, questioner in this section is Stacey Dina, who is one of the prosecuting attorneys. She's a new addition, Stacey Dina. I don't know whether she's related to Judge Dina, who is the original judge in Carroll County who recused himself. I don't know whether there's any relationship between them family relationship same surname same spelling i don't know so the questioner is stacy dina and then the answerer is stephen mullin so stacy says now the interview by agent paul of brad holder was subsequently discovered that the audio video recording was no longer available is that correct mullin says yeah that's correct can you describe the circumstances and how you learned that it was no longer available? Where would you like me to begin? Well, I would say at the beginning, <laughs> tell me everything you know. <laughs> but <clears throat> obviously she's the state's attorney. She wants to lead him <laughs> into uh, uh, a state-worthy answer, doesn't she? So... Start with a description of where the interview recordings were kept. Okay, so this is his description. At the beginning of the investigation, we started out at the Delphi Police Department. And at the time, as chief, I had just installed a new interview system. So they're blaming it on tech issues, right? right spoiler alert. This is a new system, new system. It was a DVR which we put in because we didn't have anything sufficient in the county to be able to record interviews within the city of Delphi because it's a very small, it's not even a city. I mean, in in my country, like Delphi's got like 3,000 people. In my country, it would be a, a large village or a small town. There's probably more people living in my village now, um, given all the outskirts than are in Delphi. <laughs> so I wouldn't certainly not call it a city, but it's tiny, tiny. So no, they don't have a lot of crime there. You know, this, this was a problem for Delphi, for law enforcement, because of the, just the nature of the beast, really, just the nature of this. But that doesn't excuse them being absolutely terrible <laughs> at the investigation because they did have, right from the beginning, 
They had the help of the Indiana State Police and they had the help of the FBI right from the beginning. So there was no excuses, really. But anyhow. All right. So it's a new DVR that they put in because they didn't have anything sufficient in the county to be able to record interviews within the city of Delphi. So as we use a facility at the Delphi Police Department for the investigation process, it became natural for everyone to use the interview room at the city police department, which was located downstairs inside the police department. And as interviews were conducted, officers would go into the interview room, flip on the switch on the outside, illuminate a blue light to indicate the recording was uh, operating. All right, so that, that seems easy, doesn't it? All right, so they have this DV, DVR system. Does that stand for digital video recorder? I don't know. So they flick a switch and it turns on. And it's obvious it's on because it's got a big blue light, right? So bear that in mind. That becomes very relevant very quickly. When they concluded, they would shut the interview room, uh, the recording off, by turning the switch off. That's not rocket science, is it? No, it's not like they have to put in cables. It's not like they have to go and get special equipment and set it all up. No, it's all there. It's all installed. All they have to do is flick a switch on. And then when they've done and they're leaving the room, flick the switch off. That surely is not a problem for anybody to do. All right. The DVR was located inside the squad room at the police department. And it was sitting on top of a filing cabinet. So it's right there on top of a filing cabinet for anyone to get to. At that time, I was more or less obtaining the video off of the DVR for the officers at their request. So they could attach it to their reports. So Steve Mullen could go to the DVR. He could download anything he wanted and give them, give the officers whatever they wanted from it. He was the chief. He ultimately is the person in charge of this. All right, cool. Okay, so Stacey Dina says, and you were not part of the lead agencies for this investigation. Is that correct? Answer. As chief of police, I was not part of the investigation, but I'd become part of the United Command somehow. <laughs> Do you mean somehow? So the United Command was this kind of small inner sanctum so as the Delphi investigation progressed, this unified command was this inner sanctum of investigators, which were like some were Indiana State Police, some were Carroll County Sheriff, some were from Delphi PD. You know, they were like sharing information through this kind of small network. And then you had other pockets of investigators who were doing other stuff. Uh, so that's how Click, Forensic and um, Murphy went on to investigate the Ordinus for three years. And it's interesting that in Todd Click's testimony, he said he was trying to give them stuff and they were ignoring it. Anyway, anyway. Okay, so he he became part of the Unified Command because of your position as Chief of Police in Delphi. Yes. And so the lead agencies would be whom, if you know? Indiana State Police, Carroll County Sheriff's Department, and obviously the FBI. So surely all of those great minds coming together should have been able to, you know, at least run a, a solid investigation. But no, no, they didn't do that, did they? No, no. All right. So Stacey Dina says, OK, so tell us about the discovery of loss of video. That includes the Brad Holder, 20, February 17, she, confusing. So it's February 17th, 2017 interview. So just three days after the girls were found. Around August of 2017, I went into the police department to recover a video off of the DVR which I believed was unrelated to this particular case. So they had all, but it wasn't just the Delphi case that was being, you know, the interviews were being stored on this DVR player. It was all interviews that were being conducted at the Delphi PD. So not just files from the Delphi case were on this particular DVR. All right. 
which I believe was unrelated to this particular case, and noted that the DVR was recording continuously. So remember, this is August. So noticed that this DVR was recording continuously. That meant that any video that was on the DVR prior to the date where it recorded up to was gone. Thank you, Purple AJ, for the $20. That's very, very kind of you for the number one emoji. <laughs> Thank you so much. So it meant that any video that was on the DVR prior to the date where it was recorded up to was gone. It was no longer there, no longer recoverable. I, through my investigation, found that the last date of the interview was either the 19th or 20th of February. So unfortunately, all the interviews that have been uh, re conducted during that period of time and after the crime, homicide, was discovered up to that date were gone. They were all gone up to that date. Now, remember, this was a new system. Now, he doesn't say when it was installed. Was it installed a week before the murders, a month before the murders, a day before the murders? We don't know. We just know that it was a new system. All right. So everything up to the 19th or the 20th was gone. Dun, dun, dun. Immediately, when I discovered that the recorder was recording continuously, I unplugged it and contacted the vendor. And we determined that the videos were gone and that somehow the settings had been changed. Shucks! Those darn settings just gone and changed themselves. No. Oh, no. They've just gone and changed the settings. It's the settings, guys. New systems often do go wrong. Yeah, they do. To be fair, they do. But settings don't just suddenly change, right? This is what I'm saying. Settings don't just suddenly change. In the DVR, to only record when the switch was activated to record continuously. And when we had no idea how it could have happened. I thought he said that when you turn the switch, it turned it on. And then when you turn the switch off, it turned it off. What good would there be of having an off switch that doesn't turn off? Did the factory reset it? I don't know. Don't know. Don't know. And have you consulted with the vendor about that particular issue to discern whether it was from a person versus just a spontaneous event like electricity going out or unplugging the equipment? That's a ridiculous question. If the electricity goes out, it would turn off, wouldn't it? The recording would turn off. No. Oh, I don't know. All right. I have. I talked to the vendor and he has told me that on many occasions with the DVRs, which he uses or sells, that the, a power surge or unplugging the DVR could change the settings in the DVR so that it would record continuously. What a ridiculous system then. <laughs> I want my money back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just have something that just suddenly decides to change its own settings. But we'll go, we'll go with it. We'll go with it. That it could be just an absolute freak occurrence. And that somehow, somewhere along the line, it started recording continuously. And then it it, it wiped all of those um all of those interviews up to conveniently February 19th or 20th. Now, Patrick Westfall was interviewed on February the 19th. But we also learn that Patrick Westfall, his interview wasn't recorded because the FBI interviewed him at his house. And apparently the FBI don't bother recording interviews. Who'd, who'd have thought? <laughs> they don't bother recording interviews. 
Okay. All right. So the murder of the girls is February 13th of 2017. Well, that's when they're reported missing, correct? Yes. And the investigation began as soon as the bodies were found. Would that be fair to say? Yes. And then your discovery would indicate the interviews conducted in that interview room with the DVR were missing from 2014. No, that's wrong. Um, but the, that's an error. Until February 20th. So I, I think it should be February 14th until February 20th, but not including February 20th. I think that there's some still available to be seen on the 20th. Okay, so there might be some missing, but some are there for the 20th. Yes. And I should also add that some of the audio was missing, even for the time where there was actually video visible. So there may be video that's visible, but the audio randomly sometimes is not available to be heard. So basically, you've got a video, but the mic doesn't turn on. I mean, look, this system, where did they get this system from? It's shockingly bad. If it, if it d decides to just reset itself to some random setting when there's a slight power surge, that's a problem. But when it randomly records without audio, that's also a problem. Because <laughs> how do you know what you're going to get? I mean, it could be true. It could be true. Okay. And uh, did you or anyone that you know of intentionally leave the recording on so that it would delete interviews? Absolutely not. No. Oh, absolutely not. No, absolutely not. Do you consider this to be either human error or just a spontaneous event with the DVR recording? That's the only explanation I can provide. What? Which? So it's either human error or it's just a spontaneous random event from really rubbish recording system. Okay. Now, during that time period, there was also a follow-up interview with Brad uh, regarding Brad Holder. Is that correct? Follow-up interviews to finish the lead or tip investigation. Is that right? Can you be more specific with your question, please? Yes, because that made no sense. Sure. When Brad Holder was initially interviewed, what was going on with the investigation during the first few days where the officers would be like Special Agent Paul would be sent to make contact with someone? Can you describe for us what's going on? That, see, even that doesn't make sense. Okay, so he says, my recollection of the process was, as each day would happen, we would start with a meeting at the beginning of the day and tips and leads would be assigned to officers to follow up on or throughout the day as officers became available, they would follow up on tips and leads as they had time to do so. If people walked into the city building as a way to provide information to officers in the investigation, someone on station would take that interview and talk to the person who was providing the information. All, right, all sounds good, doesn't it? Cool. As someone came to the, if someone came to the Carroll County Sheriff's Department, they would either be instructed to come to the police department so they could talk, so they could talk with them, or <coughs> excuse me. A phone number or contact information would be forwarded to someone in the command structure so that could be followed up as soon as possible. All right. So Richard Allen was one of the people who came forward and um, he got Dan Dullard meeting him in some local grocery store <laughs> to take down what he had to say. All right. And Dan Dullard believed he recorded all of his interviews but can't find that keep looking though and were the instructions given on in the morning of these daily meetings about the use of the dvr if someone wished to use it yes they were instructed as to how to turn on the recorder and to be sure to turn it off afterwards cool right and when you discovered that it had been continuously running did you look to see if someone had left the switch on. 
which would cause it to then continuously run. Thank you. I did. But I knew it wasn't on because the switch was located in a very conspicuous location in the hallway at the police department. If I was to walk in the police department through the door from the outside, I would immediately see the blue light light on, on the interview room switch. And I would realize someone left it on. And so it would be turned off on that day. There was no light on. <laughs> I mean, it, it, so it wasn't human error then was it it wasn't human error if someone if someone had let it run in had left it running right on purpose to wipe some interviews they'd obviously turned it off all right they would, they would either have to keep turning it off or someone had to wipe it via a different means. Or this machine, <laughs> this is what I, I can't get my head around. This machine was recording even though it wasn't on. <laughs> how can that how can that be? How can that be? If you turn the switch off, if you if you turn your off switch on your computer off, or, or on your on your TV, or, or on your or you turn your phone off. It doesn't continue to record, does it? I mean, do, is there anybody who is a, an expert in these DVR recorders that police might use? Is it possible? <laughs> is it possible for it to record even if it's off? Blissful essence. that's exactly what I said. When this came to light, that's what it, exactly what I said. The, it's like using a cassette tape. And if you want to wipe it, like you can tape over it, like you can have your, your, your tapes and you're bored with it, so you can tape over it, just, just continue to tape over it. But if you want to wipe it completely, you just leave it running. You just leave it running and it will record white noise. A DVR doesn't work like that. How does it work then? So the DVR does not need to be on to record a show, but it does need to be plugged in and have power. Okay. But if this switch is turned off, wouldn't that t wouldn't that turn the power off? Like you would think that the switch turns the power off. Or does that switch only partially turn the power off? Recording off the TV is different from a live feed. Can it record anything in the room? Yeah, so it's not the same as a TV. No, this would be this would be the equivalent of turning a video recorder on. So either on your computer, your phone. So to record on your phone. Just go to your video settings and click record, right? And it records. And then when you're finished, you turn it off. But it can't record if there's no power. If you turn the power switch off, it can't record. Nothing works. So DVR does, when set up to continuously record, when space fully overrides, Okay, wipes or recordings. Yeah, I get that. I get that that's what might happen. But if the switch, the power switch is off, if the power switch is off, how can it continue to record? Because Stephen Mullen is saying here that 
he would know if that DVR was recording because the light would be on. But he, he knew the light wasn't on. So somebody either had to go in and turn it on without him knowing and then turn it off. But presumably to record over several hours or several days, it would have to be it would have to be recording for several days to to wipe out several days of interviews. It would have to record for the same amount of time. It would have to get full and then start recording over the old stuff. So that light would have to be on. Or was somebody going in and every time Steve <laughs> Mullen wasn't there, was turning the switch on and letting it record over for a few hours and then turning it off and then going back and turning it back on again. I mean, come on, it's ridiculous. Did someone take the bulb out so it didn't look like it was recording? I don't know. I don't know whether it was possible to do that. Whether it was possible to tamper with the light. Small police departments, so no good control who's got access to the tech. They screwed up. Yeah. It sounds to me like someone tampered with it. I'm not saying him at all. I'm just saying there's a lot of room here for tampering. <laughs> Cleaning lady hit the wrong light when she entered the room. <laughs> well, I suppose if she was hitting the hitting the wrong light every time she entered the room, maybe. But this was like, it had something like six terabytes of storage space. This wasn't something with a, a tiny amount of storage. This would have to be a persistent, like leaving, you'd have to leave it on for weeks to fill six terabytes. Six terabytes is a lot of storage space. When did they discover? Um, August. So it says up here. August. Hold on. What does it say? There. Around August of 2017. So March, April, May, June, July, August, six months after the murders, they found out that these recordings were missing. I, 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 we, need, we need a DVR expert to say, does that blue light that Mullins talking about is that the only power switch? So does the DVR have another power switch? So even if you turn that light off, it still has the potential to have power and to record. If so, then yeah, it's possible it was some kind of system error. A bad one, <laughs> a very flawed system, but possible. But if not, if that switch is the only switch, Then, then that's a problem, isn't it? If that's the only power switch, then it has to be someone tampering with it. Anyway, where was I up to? Where was I up to? All right, here. So I'll read this bit again. I did, but I knew it wasn't on because the switch was located in a very conspicuous location in the hallway of the police department. If I were to walk in the police department through the door from the outside, I would immediately see the blue light on, on the interview room switch, 
and I would realize somebody left it on and it would be turned off on that day. There was no light on. Okay. And the actual hard drive of this DVR, how much data could it hold? I believe it was, I'm sorry, I think it was six terabytes. Well, that's what I've heard as well. My report, my report reflects the size. That's quite a lot. A lot. It is a lot. Okay. So my question to you is, during this time period between when the first, well, let's go back to the where that leaves were conveyed. So you have those meetings each day, officers come, you have this contact with them to give them instructions. Would it be fair to say that you have different officers pretty much every day, depending on who's available? It was quite fair to say there were different officers every day. There were officers who worked within the departments who were coming in every day, but there were also officers that came outside of the Carroll County Sheriff's Department, Indiana State Police. There were officers from West Lafayette, Lafayette, Tip Tippecanoe, Tippecanoe County Sheriff's Department, others. In fact, Special Agent Adam Paul and Hammond Poli Police Sergeant Christopher and Hammond Police Sergeant Christopher Gutti, Gutti, who appear in these reports, or is that Gutti? <laughs> right are not local officers. No, they're not local to our area. So consumer DVRs recording the background when the surface level power is turned off. Okay, so it is possible to, for the blue light to be turned off, but there still be power to the system. Okay. It's a crazy system then. Like in a, in a police department where they're <laughs> recording potential suspects in a, a murder case that they have a system that's so bad. Right. And so in what capacity were they at these meetings or assisting? Special Agent Paul and Kis Christopher Gutti were there to assist us in the process of following up on tips. And they, like the others, would be there at the beginning of the day and receive instructions, or throughout the day, receive new instructions on where to go interview and to follow up on. Can you give us a brief description of what a person in their capacity would be asked to do when following up on a lead or tip in order to be useful to the investigation? They would seek out the information from either the seek out the person they needed to talk with and then interview them concerning the information that was either provided about them or from them. And then of that person was, would there be anything about the person that might cause the officer to need to do more than just take an initial interview? For example, find out where they were on the day of February 13th or February 14th. Yes, all the officers were asked to follow up on that completely or as much as possible to determine where they were on February 13th, around the time we believe the homicides were to have occurred. Okay. Okay. So that brings me back to Brad Holder. Before the video was lost or discovered lost in August of 2017, and after Special Agent Paul did his interview on February 17th of 2017, was there additional follow-up with regard to Bradley Holder that you know exists because of your intimate knowledge of discovery that and taking care of reports with regard to this case. Yes, there is. And do you recall what it is? I'm sorry. Do you recall what it is? Yes. I'm going to show you what's marked as Stakes Exhibit 4. I apologize. Can you identify that? There we go. Okay, sorry. Can you identify that? I can. Okay. Can you describe it for us? This is the report which was completed by Special Agent Rich Davis of the FBI. It describes follow-up, which was done and relayed to him by Grid Officer, 
which is a task force officer assigned to the FBI, Fred Rogers, where he follows up on Brad Holder's work history on the date of February 13th, 2017. Okay. So that would be a lead follow-up, correct? Yes, yes. And did the content of that provide information as to Brad Holder's whereabouts during that particular day when the murders were believed to have occurred? Yes, it did. Okay. And so with regard to leads being assigned to officers, would this lead to a particular event with regard to lead follow-up with Unified Command? Does it put it in this particular category? Is it considered completed for the time being? That's a whole bunch of questions to be answered with just a yes. All right. Okay. It completed the investigation concerning Mr. Holder, unless something new became available. Correct. Okay. During the time period between when the first interview was taken and recorded and the date that you were made aware of the first recording is missing, are these the only interviews of, that Mr. Mr. Holder occurred? Yes. And the second interview, or the second report, really isn't an interview of Mr. Holder. It's a follow-up about Mr. Holder. Is that right? That's correct. Okay. So at that time, that the video was lost, destroyed, whatever terminology one might want to use, was Brad Holder a key suspect in this case? No. Well, here's the thing. We don't know when that video was lost. We don't know when it was lost. It could have been lost any time within that six months. It was discovered to have been lost in August, but it could have been lost way earlier than that. We don't know. So we can't say the time when the video was lost because we don't know when the video was lost. And at the time he was interviewed, he was a potential suspect. And then they went and followed up to see where he was on the day that the girls were murdered. At that time, he was still a suspect or at least a person of interest. But we don't know when that video was lost. So that's irrelevant. You can take that line of thought process out of the equation completely. We don't know when the video was lost. Or oh, does someone know? Does someone know when that video was lost? Maybe. However, we don't know when that was lost. And we, we've got to believe that Steve Mullin doesn't know when it was lost either. Someone might know, but he doesn't. All right, so Brad Holder's alibi was that he was at work. Now, it's my understanding that um, not a lot was actually done to follow up. It was basically ringing his work and saying, well, was he there? And someone saying, well, yeah, he punched in. Um, yeah, he punched in that day. But when were the girls murdered? Because if he left at, let's say, 3 p.m., he's not going to make it to Delphi for the time that the, we think. Well, certainly when they were kidnapped off the bridge, we think that that was around 2.13, based on the Bridge Guy video. So he, can't, he couldn't have been there for the kidnapping. If he truly was at work, he couldn't be there for the kidnapping. But he could have been there for the murder because we don't know when the murders took place. They could, those, those murders could have taken place any time after 2.13, all up until the following day when they were found about midday. So we don't know that they were murdered straight after they were kidnapped. We don't know that. We don't know that because we do not have the autopsy report, we do not have an estimate of the exact time of death. So we can say, if it's true Brad was at work, he wasn't bridge guy. That's all we can say, though. That's all we can say. At this moment in time, that's all we can say, that he wasn't bridge guy. And we know that Patrick Westfall wasn't bridge guy because he's too tall. 
but there's a whole bunch of these people, a whole bunch of these people, any one of them could have been Bridge Guy. So I say to you again, did they check Brad Holder's? Not Brad Holder's. Did they check Patrick Westfall's alibi? No. He said his son was his alibi. But Patrick himself said his son was at school that day. We know that Elvis Fields lied about his alibi. Rod Abrams lied about his alibi. We know those things for a fact. So just because Brad Holder had an alibi and couldn't be bridge guy doesn't mean to say that Richard Allen murdered those girls because there's a whole bunch of comrades surrounding Brad Holder. Brad Holder wasn't the, the head honcho here. Patrick Westfall was. Because you've got to remember that Patrick Westfall took Brad Holder's patch, allegedly, when he found out that uh, Brad Holder was going to a Christian church. You can't be both. You can't be Asa True and a Christian. So he took his patch. That's what Patrick said happened. Amber Holder, who was there to testify here at this, at this hearing on March 18th, but wasn't allowed to because it was too far out of the scope, so Andy Baldwin just had to give her a summary of, of her, what she, what she would have said. But just very, very bad. Very bad. Very bad. All right, let's move on a little bit because there's lots of, there's an objection here. All right. Patrick Westfall. Do you have knowledge that Patrick Westfall was interviewed? Yes, I do. In February 2017. Yes, I do. I'm going to show you States Exhibit 5. It's got two pages. Can you identify that? I can. And what does that document contain? This is a report that would have been found in the FBI general reports given to the defence in discovery, detailing an interview which took place on Sunday, February 19th, 2017, conducted by Special Agent Adam Paul and grid officer. I'm sorry, Officer Guti with the Hammond Police Department, where they did an interview at Patrick Westfall's residence of Patrick Westfall. And is that particular document also contained within discovery as previously testified to? Yes. In the same location as documents with regard to Brad Holder? Yes. In FBI general reports and in Orion? It is. Yes. Okay. So exhibit five is objected to, uh, sorry, not objected to. All right. There have been some questions raised about whether a video of Patrick Westfall exists. So a video interview um, of him existing or that has been destroyed by the state. Do you have knowledge about that? One never existed. And what do you rely on for that information? They went to Patrick Westfall's residence. One, it was uncommon for the FBI to record their interviews. The FBI don't record interviews. Is it standard that the FBI don't record interviews? You would think that they would, but anyway, who am I to say? Not even American. Who am I to say what the FBI do or don't do? <laughs> I find it odd, but there you go. Two, we talked with Special Agent Paul who told us he did not record the interview by any means and only memorialised it in his report. And just to reiterate, even though you've already answered this in general sense, was Patrick Westfall a key suspect in 2017? No, 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 wasn't a suspect. So what, what did the interview him for then? Did you make attempts to retrieve or somehow recreate lost video from the continuous play. Oh, that goes on to something else. So Patrick Westfall was never considered a suspect. <laughs> Westfall was never considered a suspect. So where he was on February 13th into 14th didn't matter to them. Was never a suspect. So we've got Brad Holder, we've got Patrick Westfall, who were interviewed early doors. Didn't take, didn't take DNA samples from them. 
didn't take fingerprints from them, didn't do anything, you know, voluntarily, voluntarily, you know, to help us with our investigations and all that stuff. No, didn't do any of that. Didn't check on Patrick's alibi, any of that. And it was only in August 2023 when they, when the state knew that the defence had found all this stuff out about these ordinists that they got them back in, that they got them back in. And took DNA. Yeah, how crazy is that? And Elvis Fields, if you read Todd Click's um, testimony here in this same document, they wanted to get a search warrant for Elvis Fields' trailer, and that request went unanswered because of the things he said to Kevin Murphy, law enforcement officer Kevin Murphy, when he said, uh, oh, well, if you find, um, uh, you know, if I can explain why I spit on one of the girls and you find DNA, as long as I can explain it, would that be okay? So Murphy followed that up and wanted a search warrant for Elvis Fields' trailer. Did he get one? No, it went unanswered. Went unanswered. Just ignored him. Just ignored him. Even though Elvis Fields, before any information had come out whatsoever about the murders, said that um, he put, quote-unquote, antlers on Abby's head and spit on her, and um, he was there on the bridge that day. And um, that's what he told one sister. Tried to give his coat away, his blue coat, tried to give that away. And his sister said, I, I don't want it, but tried to give it to her. To another sister, he said, um, I may have to go away for a while because of uh, what happened, what I did to two girls. So I don't know. <laughs> Very, very strange that there's these confessions out there. But yeah, oh, oh, who else confessed? Oh, Richard Allen. Richard Allen confessed. Mm. We don't know the nature of what that confession was to Kathy Allen. We don't know what the nature was or what mental state he was in. We don't know that. But the people who say Richard Allen's the guy because he confessed, well, what do you say? to Elvis Fields making very incriminatory statements, not to one, not to two, but three different people, one of whom is a law enforcement officer. Law enforcement officer. Elvis Fields obviously has friends in high places. Or... Oh, the investigators were just so bad at following up that they didn't bother. Didn't bother. Yeah, okay. Okay. All right. So, moving on. Did you make any attempts to retrieve or somehow recreate lost video from the continuous play of the DVR? First of all, I contacted the vendor and we discussed options for recovery. And then I presented the DVR video, excuse me, the DVR, DVR DVD to the Indiana State Police to see if they could recover the video. It was never recovered. It was never recovered, correct. In the discovery disclosures, did you share with defense that the DVR for the time period, February 14th until the 20th, had missing files? And if so, in what way? From my memory, I believe that I informed the agent from Mr. Rosie's office that there were problems with some of the video and that they could try to recover whatever video they could. But they had, in essence, the same thing we did. I did not document that in any way the time of the release at that stage before they withdrew themselves from the case. They drew themselves from the case. Yeah. Okay. So it was um, 2023, right? Um, 
at some point in 2023 when they had to admit that there was missing files. Okay, so on the discovery disclosure or transfer to defence that we referred to as the O4, based on the numbers that's on the top, it's from February 13th of 2023, that contain these interviews in written form. But is that the same day or time when you would have transferred any audio recordings or is it possible on another day? I'm sorry, Miss Dina, can you rephrase the question? Yeah because that doesn't make any sense. Yeah, the O4 disclosure that you talked about, that contained these written reports from the FBI and Orion from February of 2017. If there was video recordings that were also given, would they have been at the same time or some other disclosure? That still doesn't make sense, but I'm sorry, I can't remember exactly when I gave them uh, what I gave them at this point. I'd have to look at my records to be able to refresh my memory. I'm sorry. That's okay. It's a lot of information. Blah, 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 blah. Right. Okay. Okay. But eventually it was found out. Eventually the defense found out. They, they badgered Nick McClelland. He ignored them for a while. Um, and eventually he had to admit, it all came out in court filings. He had to admit that there was a problem. But that's only recently. Only recently that this has come out, or at least to us in court filings. All right, so moving on a little bit. Was Brad Holders the only recording that was lost? Heavens no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. And the recordings weren't just for this investigation, were they? There were other investigations that were probably conducted during that period of time in that same interview room that were destroyed as well. <laughs> so we've got a double homicide where they've lost like a week's worth of work. <laughs> Plus also potentially other interviews as well. It's not going well for them, is it? When you say, you know, teething problems with tech, well, this, this is teething problems, all right. <laughs> Look, if they hadn't have been shady, if there was nothing shady about this investigation and this happened, you would think, all right, it's teething problems. Yes, it's, it is possible. And you'd kind of feel sorry for them a little bit that, you know, that they've, they've just been they've just been done over by this really bad DVR system. <laughs> they've been sold dud. You just think, oh, <laughs> if they were good cops, you know, if if everything else was on the level, you'd, you'd just assume this was a mistake and it's no one's fault. It's just a mistake. <laughs> but no, <laughs> you can't you can't trust any of them. You can't trust them. So. I don't know, were they lost or have they been lost? Have they been wiped? I don't know. I honestly can't tell you. I want to believe that it was just a, a mistake, but I can't trust them. So we are where we are. We are where we are. It's gone. We can't We can't change it. You're so bad. So bad. Do you have any way of recreating a list? Now, this, this is sheer. This is just sheer laziness this next bit is infuriating because you can't blame this on a power surge or a dvr that looks like it's off when it's not and it's recording when you don't know it is this is just complete and utter shoddy investigative work question do you have any way of recreating a list of all of the interviews that happened during that time frame i do not and if officers did what was expected, which is to write a narrative for interviews as that were recorded, then where would that information be contained? It would be contained within the reports and narratives that the officers memorialized their interviews. And either the state police reports, the FBI reports, or perhaps in the Orion RMS system, or even other agencies, or beyond those, correct? Yes, other agencies, and that's true. There were other agencies that did memorialise reports that we have turned over. 
But the court gave us a deadline of November 1st to provide discovery and that you did blah, blah, blah. So yeah, they turned, they turned everything over, they say. Right, we'll get to that in a minute. Right, look, the question here is not what other uh, agencies might have done interviews and, and memorialized them in reports. The question here is about those lost interviews. The question was, do you have any way of recreating a list of all interviews that happened during this time frame? So during the time frame between February 14th and February 20th, when this was lost, right? That's surely somebody, and he's the chief, so surely it should be his job to make a list of everyone that was interviewed in his department, period. Like, you don't have a list? You don't know who you've interviewed? Well, how do you know who to follow up on then? How, how, do, you, <laughs> how do you keep a record of who's been interviewed, who still needs to be interviewed, who to follow? How do you know? Do you just leave it to chance? That's ridiculous. If you're having morning meetings, that's the time when you would say, all right, here's a list of who was interviewed in this department yesterday. Have I missed anyone? And then the cops each day can say, yep, yeah, that sounds right. No, no. They can't do something as simple as making a freaking list. <laughs> they don't even have a calendar. <laughs> so how do you expect them to operate a DVR when they don't even have a calendar? <laughs> Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. Lord in heaven. All right. So it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what the other agencies were doing. Yes, they're going to have to pull them out of, you know, different systems and stuff. Great. Fine. That's perfectly normal. But in Delphi Police Department, he was the chief. He should have had a list of who was interviewed in his department. That's just shockingly lazy. That's lazy. No other word for that. No other word for that. All right. So this is to do with the discovery. Do I need to read this? Really? All right. Tips from the tip line. Okay. We know that. So in the beginning, uh, when did you start your discovery transfers to the defense? I believe uh, the 7th and shortly after their appointment, would that be right? So they were they were appointed mid-November. A Ryan RMS automatically keeps a record after officers input the names. Well, obviously Stephen Mullen, <laughs> Stephen Mullen doesn't know. And if you have to input the names though, don't you? So if there's interviews that are taking place and no one's actually inputting them into a system, that system will never record them, will it? <laughs> oh, dear, 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 dear. All right. So they talk about the discovery. Um, I don't really want to talk about that, honestly. So they, they reckoned that they had everything to them by November 1st, because remember, this case should have gone to trial. Jury selection was due to start on January the 8th. So all the discovery should have been in by November 1st. That was the deadline. So now we've got all of this stuff that's come out. Let's read this paragraph, for instance, as an example. And we know this through court filings. Recently, we, we recovered some interviews the state police had located on one of their devices that had been recovered because of an inquiry about an interview that had taken place. And that was furnished to us a few weeks ago. And we turned it over to the defence as soon as we got it in our hands. So there's just stuff randomly out there. No one's taking track because no one had a list. <laughs> so, so we've got the Indiana State Police now 
who are finding stuff on random hard drives. I'm thinking, oh, <laughs> this relates to Delphi. Maybe we should have given this in. So the question is, what else is out there? What else is out there that we don't know about? To me, to me, this is paving the way for it to get all the way to trial. And then Nick McClelland pulls some interviews out of his ass that the defence has not had their hands on. That, that, that's what I feel is going to happen. That's what I feel this is paving the way for. Oh, by the way, we've got this. And oh, by the way, we've got this. And then when Slick Nick turns up at trial, all slick like, and says, "Oh, by the way, we 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 found this down the side of a filing cabinet. Oh, we found this down the side of the sofa. Um, you know, do you want to have a look at it? Because we're going to talk about that today. And if it was a decent judge, they could have a very frank conversation with the judge and say, "Look, we're having problems with the state." bringing interviews in or giving us stuff that they've just happened to find down the side of the sofa, can we have a final deadline and anything at all that comes in after this deadline does not get taken to trial? Can we have an absolute? Now, that should be standard. That's absolutely what happens on every trial. There's an absolute deadline. But because we have this absolute shoddy system and this biased judge she's just going to let any willy-nilly interview in if if slick nick wants to slick nick wants to she's going to go oh, it's fine nick it's fine nick it's crazy crazy all right let's move on all right all right cross-examination we'll read a little bit of this so this is um, Andy Baldwin now interviewing Stephen Mullen. So let's read a little bit of this cross-examination. So questioner is Andy Baldwin. Answerer is still Stephen Mullen. So he's straight in with, so let me get this straight. Let me get this straight. You knew, you knew in August of 2017, that Brad Holder's video was missing and it had been taped over, right? Well, let me make, I'll strike that, you know. In August of 2017, that from February, what's that? The 14th up to February 20th. Uh, and there's, there's no longer existed those videos, right? Yeah, that's correct. Well, then. When you provided the defence with discovery in, let's say, I think it was for the first time in December, you, you didn't say, hey, by the way, I need to tell you this. There's some missing video of people that were interviewed in the very early stages of this case. You didn't tell me that, did you? You didn't tell Mr. Rosie that, did you? Because remember, they've known about this. They've known about this since August of 2017. They started sending discovery over to the defence in December of 2022. So why didn't they make a list? <laughs> oh, why? Oh, yeah. Because they didn't know. They couldn't do. They couldn't just give them a list and say, look, really sorry, these interviews, these interviews here, we did do these interviews. We've got summary reports of them. However, I'm really sorry, we had a hiccup with our system. We only found out in August of 2017. There was nothing we could do. We tried to fix it, but I'm really sorry. But no, that didn't, that, that's not what they did. No, that's not what they did. I didn't tell you, and I didn't tell Mr. Rosie that, but I believed I mentioned it to your agent, his agent. It's from memory, my memory. I didn't write it down. I didn't document it. No, you didn't write it down just like you didn't write it down who was actually interviewed in the department that you were the chief of in a double homicide case of two little girls. 
didn't write down who you'd interviewed. No, he, he's obviously not very good at writing here, this guy. All right. But it's not. Okay. Well, did you tell Mr. McClelland that they were missing? Oh, yes. Yes, he knew. <laughs> <laughs> so he knew McClellan knew so so they were able to remember to tell McClellan and I bet you he knows exactly who those interviews were <laughs> but they didn't bother telling the defense <laughs> oh dear dear this this is funny but there's a man, there's a man sitting in a state prison. He's sitting in a state prison awaiting a trial. And this is the state of the people who were trying to convict him. <laughs> I'm laughing because it's just, it's, it's shocking. There's no words for it. You did. Okay. So, in your is this part of the packet that you just introduced into evidence? This from August 22nd that you just introduced that into evidence. I don't know which number it is. Miss Dina says, okay. So, in August of 2022nd, we got, you're involved in these letters that go to Mr. McClelland or come from him. I want you to look at the very bottom I've highlighted. And that's one of the exhibits that's been introduced. I don't remember which. So Miss Dina says, number two, exhibit two. Okay, exhibit two. Page 11, exhibit two. Yes. Read on the bottom of that, just to yourself, where I highlighted, just in case. I'm going to ask you a question about that. Yeah. May I have that? Sure. So in August of 2023, here's what you said about Brad Holder's video that we requested. So August of 2023. So a whole six years, this is a whole six years after they discovered that these <laughs> interviews had been lost, either by human error or by, um, I don't know, a power surge and a power light that is off, but then somehow it's magically on. I don't know. All right. So, you had previously received Indiana State Police reports that document those interviews and what was said in those interviews. Though we didn't locate any videos of those interviews, right? Correct. What you didn't say was, that's because they were taped over, did you? You didn't tell us that, did you? I didn't include that information, no. We did not learn about that, this taped over business, that this taped over business happened until February of 2024. Isn't that right? Yes. As I said, this all came out in court filings, but it was very recent. I talked about it when it came out very recently. So Nick McClellan knew all along of these missing interviews but nobody bothered to tell the defense there was letters there was there was requests there was there was things between them all the way you know all the way from august of 2023 but yeah it was only in february of 2024 that they actually admitted that those interviews have been taped over. Yeah, busted. <laughs> A new book, Delphi Law Enforcement for Dummies. Yeah. I mean, this, I mean, look, a system error. Like I said, if if they were good cops, if they, they were, they'd never done anything shady, I would say, listen, this, this is, you know, it's a new system. They they got it up and running. They didn't know that it would reset or change settings if there was a power surge. They were they were they basically you know sold a dud system. It had loads of flaws in it, and I'd leave it at that. But no, we've got they don't bother telling them. 
they just they just ignore the fact that these interviews don't exist anymore and are just hoping that Andy Baldwin and Brad Rosie aren't going to notice. <laughs> and they don't they don't even allegedly have a list of who was interviewed during that time, uh, whose interviews might be lost, both on this case and any other cases where interviews took place at the same time. They don't seem to have that information. Or do they? Maybe Nick knows. Maybe Nick knows. I don't know. I don't know, you guys. <laughs> then we asked for any reports that detailed the lost recordings. And we just got that in evidence in the last couple of weeks, right? Correct. I'm going to hand you what's going to be marked as Defendant's Exhibit E and ask you to identify that for me. Hey, all right. Tell me if you know about that. That is a document, a report that I requested. We requested about, hey, tell us about what? How did you memorialise the lost videotaped interviews, right? And that's what you gave us, Exhibit C. Yes, or uh, it doesn't, you see, it's not dated though, is it? It's E. E, thank you, sorry. All right, blah, blah, blah. This document that we just got in the last couple of weeks, it's not dated, is it? There's no date on it. There's no date on it. Did you just produce this? No. You produced, you wrote this all the way back in 2017. Yes. And we've just gotten it in 2024. Yes. After we had to request it right. Yes. So they were just hoping that it had gone away. So whatever this document was, <laughs> Stephen Mullin says it was written in 2017. And whatever it is, Andy Baldwin doesn't believe him, clearly. And that wasn't the only thing we got. I'm going to hand you what's going to be marked as Exhibit F because we wanted all reports about anything missing. Sure. Review that document, and then this was provided to us in the last couple of weeks. Tell me when you're ready to talk about it. <laughs> He's going to say, no, never, never. I don't want to ever talk about it. No, but he says, go ahead. That says that drive two contains the containing the data of recordings made. And this is in the third paragraph. Made by the DVR includes interviews in room one, two, and three and four were missing from April 28th, 2017 to June 30th, 2017. Is that right? Is that what it says? There's missing video for almost two months, right? So we've heard this. We've heard this. We, we saw this come out in court filings. So not only did they lose from February 13th into February 20th, everything, everything, and didn't admit it to them until February 2024, there was also a bunch of other missing stuff that they didn't admit either. <laughs> Dear God, dear God. There's missing video for almost two months, right? I'm not certain that that was the final conclusion. I drafted this report after the incident had occurred. So we don't know when this incident occurred, though. That um, in that uh, DVD, excuse me, that hard drive, there were errors associated with that DVR and that compromised the data on it. So they truly were sold a dud. If this is genuine, if this is really genuine, that someone hasn't gone along and tampered with it, then they were sold a dud. <laughs> because not only <laughs> does it turn on and off at random when it wants to and just records over stuff, it also fails to record. <laughs> so it records when you don't want it to. And does it record when you do? And, and I explained it in the report how it occurred. 
You do, but the crux of it is from a April 28th, 2017 to June 30th, 2017. There ain't no videos of any interviews, right? <laughs> I'd have to go back and review now to make sure. But I believe there may be interviews, but they may not have sound. <laughs> <laughs> We've heard about all of this, but it's just funny to read it in their own words. <laughs> we knew this. This is not new, new, new news. <laughs> but it's honestly, honestly, seriously. And this was the first time this document, uh, Exhibit F, I think it is, was given to this of to my partner, core counsel, and I was within the last couple of weeks. And we had to ask for it, right? Yes. But we did get a narrative report of Brad Holder, right? Yes. About six paragraphs of Brad Holder. That's what his interview with police or law enforcement kind of came down to. Just a number of paragraphs, right? Yes. How long was the interview? I don't know. <laughs> well, he doesn't know who was interviewed, when they were interviewed. <laughs> So how would he know how long it was? They could have interviewed him for like eight hours straight. They could have absolutely interrogated the holy shit out of him. And no one will ever know. But, but they managed to memorialise six paragraphs. Okay, then. How do these officers even write the reports? Like, do they, do they go and sit down and type them up studiously? Like straight after, so it's all fresh in their mind. Or do they wait? Do they do they put them in a pile because they're very busy? You know, this is in the in the first throes of a homicide investigation, and you know they they're going to be all over the place, aren't they? So you could imagine that when they come to write Brad Holder's six paragraphs, they've probably forgotten some stuff. You would think that maybe they want to go back and review what that video said you'd think that they'd have found out in um you know maybe march when they actually got round to writing a report maybe or was it only found out when these officers six months later decided to write these reports and then if it's if that's true how did they manage to write six paragraphs about brad holder's interview when that interview wasn't recorded, or it been, sorry, it recorded over. <sighs> what did he say in that interview? Do you know? I don't know. What happened to his, uh, when you discovered in August of 2017, that his videotaped interview had been taped over, what did he say? When you followed up in um, September of 2017 to follow up to make sure at least that's memorialized. What was lost was memorialized closer in time to 2017. What did he say? I'm not sure if I understand your question. Did you interview Brad Holder in August of 2017 after you found out his video was missing? Just to give a good accounting of what he said. Another interview. I didn't. That'd be a good idea, don't you think? Objection! It wasn't his place to decide. Sustained. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So we got February 14th. And I'm going to summarize on this. I'm not going to read anymore. So we've got February 14th through to the 20th. So not a single log, not, not even a list of who was interviewed. Right? Not that he's aware of anyway. So the early stage of an investigation, you did an investigation at some point. <laughs> oh, he's so dry. <laughs> well, they didn't do much of an investigation, did they? Didn't do much of an investigation. I talked to people <laughs> and used investigative leads. So she talked to a few people. Double homicide of two little girls. I just talked to a few people. Okay. Would you agree with me that early on in the investigation, that can be some of the most important time frame to receive information? Yes. 
you didn't go back and re-interview any of those people from the first few days, did you? Not just Brad Holder, but anyone whose interview was lost. Well, you wouldn't know whose was lost because he didn't, he didn't make a list. I did not. And nor did you try to recreate a log of, hey, I want to send a memo out to all police officers who interview people. Please tell me who you remember videotaping because there's six days of lost video. Did you do anything like that? Or I didn't. Did law enforcement? No. No, Brad Holder was only interviewed in 2023 as a follow up because of our depositions that were focused on him. Would you agree? Possibly. <laughs> of course you did. You panicked. You all panicked and you went back and had to try to save face and re-interview these guys. There's no other reason you would have gone and deposed, interviewed Brad Holder then, right? I did not interview Brad Holder. You know he was interviewed. I heard, yes, yes. I heard he was interviewed and there's a report about it. I mean, if you could get the recording back, you would want them back. Wouldn't you agree? Absolutely. The second video time frame that we're talking about, April 28th through June 30th, there's an opportunity to get on Earth those lost videos with some type of Chinese equipment. Software, software, right. Hmm. Did you get the software? I turned it over to the state police for them to follow up with. Do you know whether they followed up with the Chinese software to work this? I'm, I'm, I seriously want to know what this Chinese software is that can materialize audio. Because remember, this April to June timeline is where there's video, but no audio. I want to know what software can recreate audio that just hasn't been captured. Because if the mic wasn't turned on, there is truly no audio. Believe it or not, I have <laughs> I have at some point in my past recorded videos for YouTube and I come to edit it and find out there's no damn audio and you can't do anything about it. If your mic didn't work, if your mic wasn't plugged in properly, if your mic... You know, you just didn't check that your mic was on. I've done this more than once. Not often, but I have done this twice or three times. And you realize your mic wasn't on and you realize there's no audio. Uh, there's nothing you can do about it. You know, you could go to China yourself. You could go and batter the best software engineers that China has. You could take it to them personally and you would not be able to retrieve audio that did not record. Anyway, neither were they. They weren't able to either. All right. So Chinese software came into place. Well, <laughs> oh, dear. Dear, dear, dear. Did you follow up once the Chinese software came into place and something seems, according to you, to have been recovered? Did you do a report on it and say, well, here's what's been recovered and here, you know, I think here's, <laughs> here's what I don't have recorded. Do you anything like that? Because I don't see any reports about a Chinese, the Chinese software working. Is there such a report somewhere that said the Chinese software worked? I don't have it. Okay. Do you have, you did other, these other reports? Hmm. Undated, right? You should have put the date on there. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, did we agree on that? I'll do better. <laughs> oh, dear. I bet Andrew Baldwin made him feel about two inches tall. I'll do better. <laughs> I'll do better. And on that note, on that note, I'm going to end this because <laughs> I'm laughing. I'm laughing about an investigation into the double homicide of two little girls. Who should be laughing about this? No one. But if you didn't laugh, seriously, you'd cry. You have to, you have to see this as an absolute comedy of errors. And that does not take anything away from these two little girls who were brutally murdered. You don't take anything away from them or their families. 
by laughing at this comedy of errors. It's frustrating. It's infuriating. I'm, I feel embarrassed for them. I feel embarrassed for them because it's just absolutely shocking. I've never seen anything like it. And then we have a man whose name is Richard Allen, who may be guilty. He may be guilty. He may be guilty. But the evidence against him, where is it? Where is it? Why? Why is there all of these wranglings? Why is there all of this subterfuge? Why is there all of this shady business that's gone on? If they truly had evidence, true evidence that could convict Richard Allen of a crime that he actually did do, then let's see it. Why didn't we get to see it in January? Instead, no, what do they have to do? They had to go and disqualify his two attorneys. Why? Why? Well, you can see how Andrew Baldwin behaves here. Andrew Baldwin run, runs run rings around Stephen Mullen here. Run rings around Stephen Mullen. So you can imagine why Nick McClelland is shaking in his little boots with his colourful socks. You can see why he's shaking in his boots. Thank you, Helen, for the 10 pounds. That's so kind of you. Thank you, thank you. You can see why he's shaking in his boots that he doesn't want to take on Brad Rosie and Andrew Baldwin, you know, across, uh, across the aisle there. <laughs> he'll, he'll literally shit his pants when it comes to the first day of trial. You have to wear an adult diaper or something. I don't know, maybe. <laughs> Shit his pants. But Richard Allen. Richard Allen. Is he just a patsy? Is Richard Allen actually an innocent man? Like factually innocent? Is he? And he, they just saw him as an easy target. Middle-aged man was out there on the trails on his own. He put himself there at the right time. And they've put him through absolute hell. Him and his family, they'll never recover. Richard will never recover. Even if, even if he is acquitted. Even if, you know, the defence win the case and he's acquitted. He's never going to recover. That guy is scarred for life. His life is destroyed. The life is his family has been destroyed. He's, it's awful what they've done to Richard Allen. Awful. And they better, they better have some solid evidence against him. Because if not, and he's acquitted, then um, I hope he sues them to the moon and back. I hope he sues their asses off this planet. I hope he does. Because how they've treated him, how this investigation had, had, had hit on Richard Allen just a few days before the sheriff's election, it's highly suspicious to me. Thank you, Suzanne, for the four pounds. It's very kind of you. It's highly suspicious to me. Highly suspicious. But, and, and Gull. She won't even let the defence pay for experts. She, she won't release funds for them to pay for experts. So they're not even fighting on a level playing field. There's um, a fundraiser. The last time I checked, it had raised $27,000 to pay for the experts that the defence need to fight his uh, case at trial. Now, juxtapose that. Oh, by the way, I've tried to donate and it won't let me donate. I, I don't know whether it's because I'm in the UK. It won't accept my credit card. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I've tried it three times, four times. And it just won't let me do it. So I, I did try to donate, but anyway. Um, 
if you if you're in any other country other than the US, has it let you donate? Like, is it my problem, or is it is it a system problem? But anyway, you can let me know in the comments for that. Um, juxtapose how Richard Allen has been treated with how Brian Koberger is treated. Try Kyle's. <laughs> yeah, try Kyle's. I've tried that, sweet dude, Shibby. I saw that on uh, Twitter. Enter the five zero zip code. I tried that. I tried entering five zeros, four zeros, six zeros. And it's not the zip code thing. It just says that it can't process my card. So you were able to from Australia. I'll try it again. I'll try it again. I'll try it on my computer rather than my phone, see if that works. I'll put my VPN on and see if that works. I, I just haven't done. I've just, just been doing it on my phone. I'll try again. I'll try it again and uh, see if it'll work with a VPN on. You had trouble doing super chats and becoming a member in different currencies, really? Am I at a limit? <laughs> Dollars denied. Yeah, maybe. No, I'm not. I've paid my credit card bill, so I don't think it's that. I'll try it. I'll try it again. I'll try it on the computer with a VPN. See if that helps. Okay, so, yeah, juxtapose what's going on in Richard's case with Brian Koberger. Brian Koberger has a whole team of public defenders. He's got experts on uh, God knows what. They've got experts to do with genealogy. They've got experts to do with, uh, they've just got all the experts. They've got all the experts they want. They have not had to. The UK is broken, it is, absolutely is. So you're able to donate from Italy. All right, it's probably just me. I'll just I'll try it again. All right, so Koberger has not had to beg on the internet for people to donate for his experts. He's got a whole team of public defenders. He's got all the experts he needs. He turns up to court looking proper sharp, like he's going for a job interview or something. He's got his lovely vegan meals, which I'd love to have, because as a vegan, I'd love to have his vegan meals. But yeah, Richard Allen is in a state prison. He is shackled in the most bizarre of ways. Where'd you donate? I'll get the link. I'll get the link. He's just shackled in the most bizarre of ways while he's in court. And they won't let they won't let his they won't let they won't pay for his defense. They they won't Gull will just, just denies any money. For his um, experts. All right, where's this link? Hold on a minute. One second. Okay. Here we go. Okay, so it's called. 
uh, pay it to so it's on payit2.com and it looks like that so i've got this directly from uh cara wernicke's website wernicke uh, her twitter page so this is genuine so I'll put the link in the chat. And I'll, I'll put it in the... It's been set up by David Hennessy. Uh, I'll put the link in the chat, so the link's there now. I'll also put it in the description box for replay viewers as well. So this is for the official expert expense fund for Richard Allen. It's once employed as a licensed pharmacist and technician at the ZPS in Delvi. October 31st, Mr. Allen was arrested for a crime that he maintains he did not commit. Mr. Allen has been accused of committing Abby and Libby's murders, but is investing everything he has to fight for his freedom and for justice for both victims of this heinous crime. He is presumed innocent until proven guilty through a court of law and has an absolute right to a fair trial, which is currently being violated. Funds are being raised to pay expenses related to expert fees and costs. So on 30th of March, the fund's target goal was increased by 20,000. We have identified the experts needed and the cost of fees, travel and lodging are greater than originally anticipated. Please be advised that no funds collected will be offset against fees related to David Hennessy's law firm, Richard Allen's defence team, or to Richard Allen. Okay, so it's for experts. So they're currently on 27.9. It, it had just, last time I checked, it had just gone over the 27. So... So you can donate any time up to May the 10th. So they originally had it on, it was 25 grand originally. So they want 45. So even if you can only afford a couple of dollars, it's better than nothing, isn't it? Purely for experts, yeah. So, right, on that note, I'm going to leave you. Love you and leave you. And if you want to... Hold on a minute. If you want to go and read this entire transcript, it's 81 pages. This was paid for by... Uh, this is Sleuthy Goosey's copy. I got this off Delphi Docs on Reddit, but I think she's got it on her Twitter as well. Uh, Defence Diaries and The Unravelling. If there's anyone else who who teamed up to pay for this transcript, then I'm sorry I've forgotten who you are. <laughs> I think those are the three that Bob mentioned. If you want to hear it read, then um, Bob and Ali from Defence Diaries did a complete read through yesterday. So you can go and check check out their channel. And Criminality, uh, Teresa, she did one section. So she's, she's splitting it up into sections. So she's also on this. So that's, uh, you know, a bit more manageable rather than if you just want to listen to it section by section. Criminality is getting guests on. And... Um, it was really good. The criminalities was really good. She had different people coming in. Oh, the lady who played um, Stacey Dina, she had me chuckling. <laughs> she was, <laughs> she had me really chuckling. Like I said, you know, chuckling about this, having some lightheartedness in this doesn't take away anything from Abby and Libby or their families. It's not laughing about the crime. It's laughing about the, just the, ridiculousness that this case has been and is still to be so you gotta laugh while you cry honestly anyway guys thank you so much for joining me go and check out criminality and defense diaries if you want to hear that this read through if you uh if you want to get it though if you want to read it yourself then it is available there on uh Sleuthy Goose's 
Twitter or on Delphi Docs on Reddit. I got it off Reddit. It may be available in other places as well. It may be shared far and wide by now. I don't know, but that's where I got it from. Okay. All right, guys. Uh, thank you all for joining me. I shall see you tomorrow. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks, as always, to the mods. And thank you to those who donated. So I shall see you tomorrow. Bye, folks.